What's up, Bathlink folks? Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, window over here. Come on. Ooh, baby. Looks like a nice day for a bike ride. Let's go. Come on. It's this way. Come on, Slowpoke. Hey guys, just standing out here in my garage. Welcome to the garage zone. Uh, my bike is right over there, but before we go out on the bike on a nice sunny day, what we're gonna have to do is put on our equipment. First things first, take off the glasses. Got those glasses off, now it's time to think about my attire as I ride around town on my bike. Uh, I'm thinking uh, a light jacket. Got that nice light jacket on. Third things first, safety first, gotta put that helmet on. Got that sweet helmet on. Now I gotta put on some shades. Now I'm ready to go on my bike. Whoa! Man, I'm B. What a great day for a bike ride. Now, like any good bike ride, it's gotta end sometime. So first things first, I'm gonna take my glasses off. First step, remove those glasses. Second step, I'm gonna remove this big old helmet of mine. Some of that sweet, sweet, fresh air. Third step, remove the jacket. It's getting a little hot outside. Last but not least, I gotta put those sweet, sweet frames on. I'm talking Warby Parkers. And that's how you go out for a nice, sweet bike ride in the sun. Inverse functions. Today we're going to be talking about inverse functions. I have a new pen. It's from a previous student of mine from many, many years ago, about 26 years ago. Um, that's right. I'm 86 years old. Not a lot of you know that about me, but it's just something you got to know about me is that I'm 86 years old. We're going to be talking about inverse functions. Um, in other words, functions that undo other functions. So maybe you can think about it as undo functions. So my bike also happens to not be a bike. It happens to be a unicycle. But let's break this down for a second. We had, let's call it, unicycle French. So the first step for unicycle French was to add jacket. The next step was to remove glasses. The third step was to add helmet. And the last step was to add sunglasses. And that eventually got to what we call unicycle French. So at the end of this, we had me on a unicycle. And we had Mr. French in the beginning. So we started with Mr. French, added jacket, removed glasses, added the helmet, <clears throat> added the sunglasses, and then you had me on a unicycle. The inverse function to that would be to start me on a unicycle and end with French. And what we're going to do is if the last thing that I did was add sunglasses, if I'm going from me on a unicycle to French, I'm going to literally invert this process. So the first step I'm going to do for this inverse function, so this, this function here was to get me onto a unicycle, and then the inverse of that is just to get back to regular old Mr. French. So the first thing, if the, first, if the last thing that we did <clears throat> was add sunglasses, we need to remove them because I, don't, I want to make sure that they're gone before 
I try to get the helmet off. The second step is going to be the inverse of this. We are going to be subtracting the helmet. So we'll take the helmet off, and since the step before that last time was remove glasses, now we have to add the glasses on. That's just the regular glasses, not the sunglasses. And then the last step is going to be remove jacket. So each step here is literally the inverse of its other. So it kind of look, goes like this. Instant replay. <laughs> So this here is what we call the inverse. Notice how in this function here, the input was Mr. French, the output was me on a unicycle, and the inverse function literally does the inverse of that. You put in me on a unicycle, follow these steps, and you get back Mr. French. The inputs and the outputs are switched. So let's see how we can use this for a few examples on inverse functions. So here, I'm going to put a, a nice little function. Let's put this function here. Let's say that there's a function so it looks like this. And we are going to write the inverse. And yeah, we're going to write the inverse function. So the first thing that we can consider is that we know that inverse functions have the inputs and the outputs switched. So if y is the output of this function, the first step that we're going to do is we're literally going to switch the inputs and the outputs. We'll keep everything the same for a second. And technically, this is an inverse function. The outputs and the, in and the inputs are switched. So we'll say this. Switch x and y. Because we're changing the inputs and the outputs of the function. Typically with a function, we do not have it written in terms of x. Usually we have y be the output axis. So whenever you see a graph, typically the y axis is known as the outputs. So for example, you input x's and get out y's. So usually we like to see the y solved for. If you write it like this, it's still valid. However, the standard really, at least in high school mathematics, is to have x be the input. So if it's, if it's solved for, it's we kind of think of it as the output axis. So what we want to try to do now is we want to solve for y. Another way we could think about this is we want to undo for y. We want to undo the function for y. So we have flipped the x and the y. We're going to undo it for y. So let's consider the order of operations. If we plug in a y, so if I plug in a number for y, let's say 0, the very first thing that would happen is I would do 0 minus 2. So I'm going to say that the very first thing that would happen for this function is we would subtract 2. After that, after we subtract 2, let's, let's say we plugged in 2, we'd go 2 minus 2, which is 0. And so we'd make that an exponent of 3. So I'm going to write that like this. So the very first thing, or er, so after we subtract 2, we make that number an exponent of 3. And then it looks like here, if we follow the order of operations, we would times by 2. I'll put a little star for times. And the very last thing we would do is add 4. So here's the cool part, is that this little list here is literally a recipe for how we are going to be creating our inverse function. An inverse function is going to undo all the steps, just like with the unicycle example. So I'm going to undo this function for y. So the last thing that it does is add 4. So the first thing that our inverse function is going to do is going to subtract 4. The next thing that our function did was times by 2, so our inverse function is going to be dividing by 2. And I'm not going to rewrite it any more complicated than it needs to be rewrited. So we'll have x minus 4 divided by 2 equals 3 y minus 2, 3 to the power of y minus 2. And so the next thing that we have to consider is undoing an exponential of 3. But it turns out there is a way that we can undo exponentials. We can use the logarithm base 3. And so we can convert to log form. Logarithms always tell you whatever your exponent is. So for example, we know that 2 to the third equals 8. So that implies that the exponent of 2 that gives you 8 is 3. It always equals the exponent. So logarithm will always equal whatever your exponent is. In this case, the exponent is y minus 2. So I know that this is going to equal that. And then our base number is 3. And then this is going to be our innards. And then the very last step that our recipe says is if the first thing that we do is minus 2, our inverse function's last thing is going to be adding 2. And once again, I'm not going to write it any more complicated than it needs to be. y equals log base 3 of x minus 4 over 2 plus 2. These two functions are inverses of one another. And if you are not convinced of that, Consider how the order of operations are working. The first thing that this one does is minus 4. The last thing that this one does is add 4. The last thing that this one does is add 2. 
But the first thing that this one does is subtract 2. So they're doing the inverse of the order of operations. They're undoing each other. Let's look at another example. What we know about functions is that, um, or what we know about inverse functions is that their inputs and their outputs are switched. So that's going to be our first step. We'd switch the x and the y. Outputs becomes the input, and the input becomes the output. And so we'd get x equals log of y minus 2 plus 4. They would simply all just have the variable switched. OK, so now we are going to be undoing the function for y. Usually, we, um, in high school mathematics, we don't really consider x to be an output axis. More consistent to consider the y axis to be the output axis. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for y. Another way we can think about that is undoing the function to reveal y. So let's consider uh, the order of operations. That's how we're going to undo our function. We are going to consider the order in which our operations are being performed on this, and then we'll just undo it to get back to y. So the order of operations would say that if you plug a number in, the very first thing that you're going to be doing to that number is subtracting 2. So I'm going to write that. You, you would take away 2. So if y was 0, you'd minus 2. Then we'll say this. You'll take the log after that. You'll take the logarithm, whatever value you have. Then the very last thing you would do is you would add 4. You would add 4 is the last thing you would do. An inverse function, very similar to the unicycle example, will follow the inverse of these operations. So if the last thing that this one does is add 4, the first thing that our inverse function is going to do is subtract 4. The next thing it's going to do is it's going to undo a logarithm. But we now know that if you, <laughs> if you watch that video, if you watch the video on logarithms and exponentials, we understand that in order to undo a logarithm, you must convert it into exponential form. Now, there's no base written here. So it turns out that the base, if we're just log, we say that it's base 10 because it's just so frequently used. And the same goes for the natural logarithm. We would say that, that has a base of e. In this case, it has a base of 10. So we'd say, make the next number into a power of 10. In other words, you're just going to convert to exponent form. Remember, a logarithm will always equal whatever exponent you need. So here's my example. We know that log base 2 of 8 equals 3 because 2 to the third equals 8. That's a little sidebar. Sidebar away. So the logarithm always equals whatever the exponent is. In this case, the exponent is going to be x minus 4. The base is always the base of the other number. So we would say this. 10 to the power of x minus 4 equals y minus 2. So the exponent equals the logarithm. The base of this is 10, so that's why the base is 10. And if we keep following here, so to undo the logarithm, we convert it to exponential form. And the very last thing we're going to be doing is undoing that minus 2 by adding 2 at the end. You'll notice this is actually kind of slick because it reveals some insight as to why we solve in the order that we do. And there we have it. We would say that these two functions, the one that we started with and the one that we ended with, we would say that these two functions are inverses of one another for a lot of reasons. The reason I'm kind of banking on right now is that this one and this one are completely opposite orders of, or I guess inverted orders of operations. So the very first thing this one does is minus 4, but then that's the last one that this one does. The last one that this one does is add 2, so the, that's the first thing that's going to happen here by the order of operations. So they, we would say that these undo each other. So here's a few examples. I'd like you to write the inverse function for the following functions. Cool. So here's a few practice problems for you to consider after watching those few examples. <coughs> um, there is a video um, in the past that you can take a look at with logarithms. Oh, boy. We did it. 100 subs. We did it. Great. Now I have to eat a really gross pizza. Thanks for doing this, but I mean, I can feel sorry for myself. But at the same time, I asked for this, and you folks delivered. But subs at Subway, they don't deliver unless you order one of the new hip, one of the new hip things that some of the kids are doing nowadays, where they order food from, and then strangers deliver the food to them, which I get. I wish I had it. I just don't. 100 subs. Oh, we could put a Subway sandwich. Oh, is that one topping? Is a one Subway sandwich one topping for a pizza? 